Hello, Imperfect Leaders. I am so excited. My new book, An Imperfect Leader, Human-Centered Leadership in After Action, is now available. You can order it by going to Amazon, Barnes & Noble. I've seen it online in lots of bookstores. And if you like it, would you please leave a positive review? Thank you so much for your support. Sometimes when you become a leader, you inherit a strategic plan, and sometimes you're tasked with creating one. Strategic planning is not easy. Often, leaders will make the misstep of rushing the process and only using a few people to create the plan. And the reality is, strategic planning must start with something called appreciative inquiry. And that's simply seeing what's going well and then seeking ways to get more of it. Strategic planning must yield in the end something I call a compelling purpose. And, and that happens when you're able to answer these two questions as a community. What do we want to create together? And how do we want to be together? Getting to that shared image is where you start. And the way that you do that is what I call harvesting the collective wisdom. Harvesting the collective wisdom of your internal and your external systems. My guest today did just that. He asked an essential question through stakeholder meetings, through a process that he followed with the help of Studer Education. And together they harvested the wisdom of the community so he could better answer the question. He got to, what do we want to create together? Sergio Mendoza is my guest. I really enjoyed our time together. Thanks for tuning in. Today on An Imperfect Leader, Mr. Sergio Mendoza is my guest. Sergio is the superintendent of the Burton School District in Porterville, California, which is California's San Joaquin Valley, located between Fresno and Bakersfield. Sergio, welcome to An Imperfect Leader. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. You know, we had a great opportunity to sit around the table and actually have a conversation on an escalator going down. <laughs> That's it's true. Maybe a good thing. That's right? true. Maybe a good thing, but I know. In fact, me. I thought maybe after we met on the escalator, you were going to um, potentially ghost my email request because no, I was kind of goofy with you. But um, you know, we really did have a pleasure meeting. Uh, I got to meet you. I got to meet your team. Uh, we were in San Antonio, Texas at the uh, American Association of School Administrators Conference. And during that time, I learned about your strategic plan and uh, the four pillars that are associated with it. It was really just a really smart model. And I wonder, would you just take a moment, tell us a little bit about the four pillars, how you went about engaging students and staff and parents and, and your community to help sort of establish a strategic plan, which is something that lots of superintendents knew and established are trying to always figure out how to build something and then stick with it uh, even when things change so would you talk a little bit about how you engage your community sure um i think one of the things that our district was looking for at that particular time in uh 2019 i became superintendent in 2018 november and right off the bat in December, I found out that a couple of our schools were really great bright spots in our district. And even one school was a bright spot. And so we started to venture out, how do we kind of make this happen? How do we scale the bright spot out and duplicate it? And so pretty much the spring of 2019, we did a couple of pilots the summer, then we came across a group that supported us uh, with creating a strategic plan. And we I actually had an opportunity to see Menominee Falls in Wisconsin that had already been doing strategic plan and implementation of it um, for over 10 years. And so we saw that. Uh, one, my assistant superintendent of instructional of educational services, he is the one that went with me there. And we came back and we signed a contract uh, with this uh, organization. The organization is Studer. And we started our process in January of 2020. Uh, unbeknownst to us, what would happen in a couple of months after that, right? But I think the the great part about that is, like you mentioned, uh, it was close to um, a little over a thousand community members. And when we talk about community members, we're talking about 
like Rotarians, business people, uh, city officials, uh, local county officials that came, and also parents that were involved in it. And we had students all the way from uh, fourth grade all the way up to 12th grade uh, participate in what was called stakeholder meetings. And so those stakeholder meetings really are what created our four pillars on, and our 11 actions under those four pillars. What was, I think the most outstanding part about that is that we even went to our classified employees, our teachers, right? And our administrators during that time. And so they all did it and even our board members. So it was a Burton community effort to come up with these four pillars. And as the process began, then we went into, right? Then we went into COVID and we didn't stop. We didn't put, put the pause button because we felt all of these areas were very important, right? To us, right? Uh, and the first one was student success, right? Then we also had, uh, employee engagement as one of them. And then we had uh, family and community partnerships. And the very last one that's kind of really has developed this past year has been the improvement and efficiency and innovation, right? That is the, those are the four pillars that all of the stakeholder groups, right? All of this community input came to those. That's why it has been a, a successful model for us. And it's not a model that I can tell you what we're doing. We don't shelf it uh, and put it away, you know, in a, bi in a binder, put it away. This is ongoing work that we receive feedback, surveys that we survey those same community groups back again annually and make sure that we are hitting the mark. And if we're not, we look at well, how can we improve? So let me see if I can summarize this a little bit. You became superintendent. You engaged in what might be called appreciative inquiry. You knew that there were bright spots in your district and you were looking at them and saying, how do we get more of that? And you were introduced to Studer, and I'm glad you mentioned them because at first you were sort of dancing around their name, thinking like, <laughs> should I talk about them? Should I not talk about them? You should, they, they do nice work. And right. um, Deanna Ashby, who goes by Dee, I yes. got to meet her uh, out of Kentucky and, and she clearly is working so well with so many districts. And so I'm so glad that you mentioned them. Um, so you engage with them. They advise you to go meet a district that it sounds like had some similarities in terms of of size or need in terms of what you were trying to accomplish. So you go uh, travel to the North Midwest out from the Central Valley. So I hope you brought a jacket and uh, <laughs> we did. and <laughs> good. <laughs> and uh, and you came back energized and you began working and clearly thinking about how this couldn't be a top down decision. So that's point one is mm -hmm. that so many new leaders enter the strategic planning with I have to be the voice and the driver of this, as opposed to taking that step back and saying, how do I harvest the wisdom of my community? And you defined community very broadly, which was so appropriate, is to say, my student voice, parent voice, community member voice, Rotarians, business leaders, every leader at every level in our district, and that means food services, custodial, they are all leaders in some way, shape or form in the district because they have responsibilities to children and their and their buildings. And so you brought them all together. And through those voices, over a thousand voices, you establish these four pillars. And then you engage in something else that I thought leaders, particularly those who are aspiring and new and even established can be reminded. There's a difference between reform and transformation. Mm -hmm. and what you were engaged in is transformation because you began these cycles of review. You set goals, but you weren't necessarily absolutely without fail anchored only to the one way to get there. You saw how you were going along the way and then you made adjustments as appropriate. Whereas in reform, it's coaching for compliance, it's high pressure, and it's this is the only way we're gonna get there kind of thing. So. I'm interested in some examples as you think back on this work of strategic planning. 
Would you describe what the room looked like as you were coming to these decisions together? What was the process that the that either you or your amazing partners um, led? How did you get to those pillars? What was one question that you asked the community that helped you get to where you want to be or where you are today? Yeah, I I believe the really question was, how are we going to make students successful, right? How do we make them college and world ready, which is part of our district, part of what the district has had in the past, right? And that's something that we're going to continue to uh, evolve with that, uh, with those four words, because I think it really kind of a uh, created a foundation of how we wanted to execute um, some of the, the words in this uh, these pillars and strategic plan. And one of the things that's even more inspiring is the whole child. We're, these pillars are looking at the whole child. They're not just looking at a student or a specific. So that's one of the things that the comments from the community came out and they recognized that we were not just kind of looking at, oh, we're going to make everybody a college going student, right? We're going to also prepare them for the real world, but also how do we support them right now? You know, we have a, a good 25% English learner, right? And we're at a 75% um, social economic disadvantaged students so we knew there there's need out there and then exasperated through covid right and people were asking for needs and help and so we saw that as this is a great way to really make um our district successful and it's yeah, a that's a careful dance isn't it about oh, yeah, I think establishing so. very very boldly that we want to prepare children for a two-year, a four-year, the military, internships, a job right out. We want children to have a plan and we're going to help them get there. And so it sounds like as you were establishing this process for a strategic plan, you had an overarching, compelling purpose. Mm -hmm. I think as new leaders and aspiring are considering how they will talk to a potential board or with their boards and community, it's establishing that shared image of what success looks like. So you can't just jump into a strategic plan. You have to have a shared image of what success looks like when you say student success, and you've established that and live by that with your mission statement. I'd like to ask you a question I ask of every guest who comes on the podcast. How does the term an imperfect leader resonate with you? Yes, I, you know, I think we should all think about ourselves as not being perfect, right? I, I believe that um, imperfect is being messy uh, about what we do. Uh, I, I already talked right now just briefly about, yeah, I follow through and build relationships, but some of that is really messy at the beginning. So you have to be an imperfect leader to truly be that perfect leader uh, because we give so much of ourselves and also are bold enough to, what is it, fail forward, right? A uh, good friend of mine always says that, that we want to fail forward always. And it is true. You know, you want to land flat on your face sometimes. And, and it is about that because you're going to get that much better that next time around. And we'll be right back. An Imperfect Leader is brought to you by Ed Connective, whose mission is to ensure student success through transformative teacher training. Ed Connective helps teachers move from awareness about strategies and frameworks to successful and consistent implementation. Their friendly coaches celebrate classroom success with teachers and with concrete classroom data, support teachers in their growth, one step at a time. I've been thinking about this a lot during the pandemic, student teachers didn't get a chance to do their student teaching with children. They just started teaching in classrooms and they need help. Across the nation, states are adopting higher expectations to make up for learning loss. That's where Ed Connective fits in. Their vision is that every student deserves a great teacher and every teacher deserves a great coach. 
Find out more by contacting them at edconnective.com. We're back for segment two of An Imperfect Leader called Imperfect Leadership in After Action. Mr. Sergio Mendoza is my guest, and Sergio is the superintendent of the Burton School District in Porterville, California. In this segment, we ask our guests to deconstruct a decision that they had to make, and then we just discuss it for a little bit. So, Sergio, what happened? Well, thank you very much, Peter. And actually, thanks for saying my name, Sergio, right? It's not not many times I can find that out, you know, with from people. So thank you for the accents in the right places. So thank you, Peter. I appreciate you saying that. I will never forget I had a child in my classroom, Eugenia. But Ooh. she would say, well, everyone just calls me Eugenia. And I said, but your parents named you Eugenia. It was the, it was a moment that I've never forgotten. So it means a lot to hear you say that. It it was a real message to me. It is. It's a it's a value I think you and I share, right? And we we need to make sure, right? We can't call everybody, you know, Eugenia because some of them are Eugenia, right? Right. Some, well, that's why you asked. Know, How would you, you like to, to be Grant? Yeah. Well, yeah. so so in that it was like. How would you like to be uh, addressed, Eugenia or Eugenia? She goes, it doesn't matter. Everybody calls me Eugenia. I said, but it's padres de you, modern. <laughs> like, uh, Eugenia. And she's like, mm, okay. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it was so good. <laughs> yeah, so I, you know, one of the things we, two years ago, um, we uh, started a new program within our district, something that I had spoken to the board about as part of our strategic plan and moving forward uh, through our district. We have a very successful dual immersion 90-10 model in Spanish here in our district. Um, what happened in around 2004, we opened a school and it's called Summit Charter Academy. And it was it's called a dependent charter school. So um, just so people know that there, there is a difference. Uh, independent charter is a, a charter school that can come into your city, into your boundaries, create a school. This is an actual school that is run by the district and uh, pretty much over, uh, we have the overarching budget and also curriculum for that. So within the charter schools, we have the dual immersion 9010 model, that's a K-5. We have a Another elementary, TK-5 also, it's an IB school. Then we have a middle school that captures all those fifth graders into six, seven, eight. And that is our IB with the dual immersion strand within that. And then we have an actual 912 comprehensive high school that all came out of that. So, but what ended up happening is we saw the success as well as the overwhelming enthusiasm to enroll in our charter school, which is Matthew uh, School and the dual immersion. And we just felt that that success, we believed we could bring it over into the district schools. At first, we thought, hey, let's just do it at all four schools. Uh, but then we also looked at that might not be a good thing. As we started to talk with administrators, who was really for it, who wasn't for it, uh, it came down to a decision of, of two schools. So it really was the best thing for us to do at that time, right? How do we get that developed? And I think then it was about we had the right people, we had the right administration leading it. Um, we had a new assistant superintendent that came from a very um highly successful dual immersion program. So had all of the success behind it, had all the background. So that's what we started to look at, at that school. And so we started with kinder, we're in first grade now, and we're rolling out to second grade. That's what the school is. So if I understand correctly, in 2004, the district authorized a charter school for the district. So dependent meaning that it is dependent on the school district for its budget, for policies, those types of things. Uh, it sounds like the decision to move to a, to allow a charter gave it some flexibility, particularly maybe with uh, bilingual education. And so in this 
immersion model, it was a 90-10. And for those who are listening, I always think about my mother who's driving, who will text me and say, what does 90-10 mean? My understanding is 90% of the language spoken will be Spanish and then 10% English. And then at some point that begins to shift mm-hmm. at a grade level. At, at Summit, at your charter school, at what point does that begin to shift? We, we do it uh, incrementally by grade level. So at first grade, then it becomes 20% English, 80% Spanish. Gotcha. So, so it, it so follows on. a progression all the way up. Correct. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And um, my experience in a bilingual program as a teacher was in the Bay Area, and I was a bilingual teacher, third grade, which was considered the transition year. So it was called an early exit model, which meant that by third grade in November, you would begin moving much more towards English only. And then by the time February was around, I guess everybody was considered bilingual and was only basically doing English. And then they went to fourth and fifth grade with primarily English. Uh, I'm giggling and cackling a little bit because (laughs) that doesn't really follow the research in terms of second language acquisition. It was more of a convenience, I guess. So, um, and I wrote an entire dissertation about it. So if anyone wants to read my dissertation about language learning and systems, I am sure it's a great, if you're having a hard time falling asleep, let me know. At any rate, this segment includes an after action review. So I'm mm-hmm. curious, you now have had the successful model 9010 mm-hmm. and you have opened a new dual immersion program or a bilingual program that mm-hmm. is a 50 50 model. So 50% English, 50% Spanish. And I'm curious, as you are looking back on that process of introducing that to your community and beginning it, since you are now, I think you said, in second grade with your model. We're in first grade, going oh, first to grade. second grade. Yeah. Okay, going to second grade. Yeah. That uh, there are things that you, when you look back, you say, man, we kind of overlooked that. So what got overlooked as you're looking back? Well, definitely, I think one of the, the biggest things is going to be um, what, how do we put people in the right position to take over the next grade level as we move forward. Because I think what was successful at the 9010 model is that everybody going into that school and as we were hiring, we were hiring that, you know, it's the 9010 model. Now that we're in a 50-50, what we're having to do is basically have a, a B-clad credential, bilingual credential teacher hold the 50% in Spanish, right? And they have to have a partner in English that is the extra 50%. So now looking back on it, that's been our struggle and is going to continue to be a struggle as we move forward because of the number of students, the number of staff that are credentialed, and then have the highly qualified bilingual credential because eventually down the road, we may run out of English models or English teachers and how and or there's too many of them at a grade level and then becomes the push and tug with the administration, our unions, why are you moving Sergio or why are you moving Peter out of second grade? He's been a teacher in second grade forever. And why are you doing that for that program? And so those are some of the things we're starting to see. You know, when it was kinder, it was kind of easy, right? And and when it was first grade, a little easier. But now as we start to kind of unfold it and look forward, um, because we are looking forward. We're not just stopping and saying, oh, every year is going to be just hunky-dory, right? <laughs> and so we are looking at, okay, how's it going to get affected? And do we have enough kids to have, you know, two classes? Or are there more than enough kids? And there's going to have to be a third class, which is an English only, not a split 50-50. So the complications on personnel is something now we're looking at better when we started it 
it, we didn't look at it. So that was a huge one we overlooked because again, I'm about building relationships, following through, and that kind of contradicts that, right? So we did, that's something we overlooked. So let's jump into relationships because you are my first guest to have both an after action review about saying, here's some of the things that we have learned and we are still learning because we're still in it. So this <laughs> is really fascinating. So what are you learning about relationships? Well, I think one of the things that we have to be preventative, right? So we are always in constant communication with the leaders at the school sites, with the instructors, right, with the community. And, and when I speak about the community, it's also um, the board members, the management level people here in our district. We really want to cascade all our information kind of at that level, right? So I talk to keep the district uh, board in, involved, then it cascades down to my executive cabinet that really talks about the finances of, of the district, the, the future thinking, and then our management level people, which encompasses like 60 personnel, counselors, vice principals, principals, you know, everybody like that. And then we get to the staff, right? And then we're having to get to kids and also their parents. So it is, it's a constant work. And I think the, the best part is that we're always in talks with everyone and trying to get that. Do we hit it perfectly? No. Uh, I think the uh, previous question, the, we, it's definitely imperfect as you're trying to build a program uh, that we have seen a successful model. We're tweaking it, but we're tweaking it because within the restrictions of what your district allows you and also enrollment, right? And so we're seeing people like it, it could be still about two years out that it becomes the boom, but it's kind of people are on the outside looking at us right now, right? Is it going to be good? Not good? You know, and we're hearing good things, but um, not yet, right? I don't know yet. So, so in my memory of being an administrator in the in California, there's a, a committee called the SSC that that helps the administration or provides feedback and advice. And I'm curious, how has your relationship improved or been challenged by the bilingual program that you now have this 50 50 model was this something that they asked for is this something that you that they are providing you feedback on what does that relationship look like uh one of the things that um i think it was a little bit of a struggle at the very beginning um, with our community uh, because you know, the parents that are we when we initially started it, right? What do you mean they're going to get 50% in Spanish, right? Because I live in this neighborhood and I don't want to go somewhere else. And, um, and that's the only thing you're going to offer. And again, that's those overlooked pieces, like you said, right? Like, um, we probably did a good job, but didn't do a great job of seeing those things uh, constructed. And so I think what's interesting now is parents are asking, oh, I'm going to your that school because I hear you have a 50-50 bilingual program. So it's starting to shift. And not only that, but I think the school sites themselves have created excitement over the program and the successes that the current teachers are having, the teams of teachers are having. They're also bringing in parents not only to the school side council, but to the PTAs or to a math night or to X night. And then you bring out the little kindergartners in the first grade, and then they're reciting poems in Spanish and English or singing in Spanish. So, so new relationships are forming. So it's yeah, great. Exactly. Yeah. So Wonderful. I think that's one of the things that um, the evolving, I think, leadership of those individual schools. And we talked about that earlier. It wasn't about us telling them that they had to do that. It was they themselves knowing how do we promote this better, right? And then asking us for support on how to promote it, right? And so 
we definitely have a great relationship because we've had a, a communications person here in our district. And so the schools, individual teachers use our person to actually get that information out quickly. What frustrated you? Wow, there's a lot of things over 35 years. No, that's <laughs> no, we'll stick no, on I one know, topic. Yeah, kidding. this is not this is not the time to list your grievances. <laughs> right? No, no, I think I think um, I think it's just the pushback still, you know, from from current teaching staff um, about what's going to happen to them, right? And and they see it uh, that that's a possibility of affecting them in the future. So I think that's frustrating because I don't want it to be, you know, a hindrance. I want them to be favorable to it. So how how do I again build that relationship, follow through, build that trust on why we're doing the program and why we want it to be successful? In the end, what was something that was good that came out of this? I think it's that it's that culture that has shifted at those sites where they are embracing kids speaking a second language in Spanish, uh, that the community has come around it um, from uh, the site leadership, the teaching staff, the parent community and the kids themselves. So I believe that is what the best thing. And at the end, we're gonna have successful kids in a dual immersion as we move forward. And our middle school is looking forward to it. Like they can't wait, you know, for four more years when that first group comes to them, how are we going to promote them to the higher level speaking of Spanish at that level? So I think that's what's been the great, great pieces. My guest again today was Mr. Sergio Mendoza, and thank you so much, Sergio, for spending time with me. You know, I was so inspired by you and your team's focus. Um, you guys were so clear and so focused on the work that you're doing. You've made it clear today that that focus and alignment is really going to bring about enduring change for the children in Burton schools. You were my first guest to bring both a learning and continued learning through a process that you're doing right now with your bilingual school. And it takes great courage and vulnerability to be able to talk about that in a way. And I sense that you have no reservations about doing that with anyone in your circle. Um, I wish you the best of success, 35 years in education. Um, your legacy is no doubt going to be a strong one. Thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you, Peter, for the opportunity. I um, I hope to continue to listen to your uh, podcast as I move forward, right? And all the different things that I do. Um, and I think it's just, uh, again, great opportunity to be able to speak out on what we're doing because we have to share what we learn. Uh, that's how we all get better. Music for an Imperfect Leader was written and arranged by Ian Varley. Sam Falbo created the Daruma Doll Butterfly Artwork. Imperfect leadership is not a scarlet letter. It is a badge of honor. It recognizes that serving as a lead learner is about being a vulnerable leader, an empathetic leader, a compassionate leader. And I'm proud to be an imperfect leader, so I hope you'll join me next time for another episode of An Imperfect Leader, Leadership in After Action. Mm -hmm.